Thank, uh, thank you very much. So this question is actually who, who, whoever wants, wants to answer, but it combines, I think, dark networks uh, and also, also what Matt, Matt Jackson just talked about. Uh, what I found fascinating in, in your study that you compared, let's say, intuitive network analysis, people were pretty good at knowing who are uh, the most central people in the network. And then, so the impressive thing is that you could show that. But of course, we know that if we analyze it really scientifically, we have much more knowledge. And it, it seems like for me, even so, humankind has always been intuitive, very good networkers. Right now, we're at a verge where the people who really map out the network uh, have a clear advantage. And these kind of like dark networks now become to light for those who can map out the networks. And there was this interesting study, I don't know if you had a chance of, uh, of looking at it yesterday, published in Science. Uh, where actually Facebook published a study in Science where they analyzed 10 million people. And the response from David Lazar in, next, to the, next to the publication was like, yeah, great. Now Facebook is studying, sci uh, f uh, studying networks and actually nobody can access the data besides Facebook. So we're kind of like in a world where science is made by companies and they, have, they are the only ones who have access to these networks. So they make science, they make business, they change the world, and they kind of like, so the intuitive and the systematic is kind of like spreading with only those who make the networks having access. And I wanted to ask, uh, what is your take on, on that in light also of yesterday's publication? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's clear that, that the world is changing in terms of the power of the information that a lot of companies have and it's proprietary, and that makes it a problem not only for science, but also for consumers. And I think, you know, we, I'm, I'm always amazed at how, how unworried we are about privacy issues, and it's possibly because, you know, we, we really need catastrophes to happen before we react, and we don't see the, the power that, that's being harnessed. And, you know, it's great on some dimensions. We get ads that are targeted to us. I, you know, I, I get bicycle ads. I love bicycles. Um, that's great. You know, I, I don't have to, to see ads I don't want to see, but, but the power that companies have to know about our lives and so forth, is, it's a little bit daunting. And as a researcher, it, it also could be an issue. And I, I guess for journals, it has to be that they're going to have rules about publishing data, and a lot of them do, and hopefully they'll keep a, a strong stand on that to make sure that data is not, um, if you're going to publish a result, you have to publish the data as well and make it freely available so other people can reproduce it and check it. And I, I think that's in, essential for the scientific community. There was, a, there was a great radio lab program interviewing the Facebook design team about these issues. And they were doing a few experiments. One was trying to incentivize people to go out and vote. And they were showing that they could actually mobilize people to go vote. And I think Facebook had meant it to be a public service. But the people they were interviewing who were studying ethics were saying this is a big technology company. They could just be targeting that ad to people who are going to vote for politicians who support big technology companies. So it's a little bit daunting that they have access to this data. They're doing these scientific experiments, and they're publishing them. But think about what they're not publishing. But I agree that journals should have some kind of across the board quality. They've done that now with biology, that you need to deposit your sequences in a repository, and there should be some requirements. I mean, as scientists, we need to be able to reproduce. And if we can't, it's not science. So I, I would like journals to have a higher ethical standard on that. So just the, the briefest response to that. As an anthropologist, it's hard to see some of our data sets just being available to the world. So there will be discipline-specific things. But I wanted to ask Matt, um, talk at Matt, ask Matt? I don't know, something like that. Um, so you tell two really cool stories. One of them basically goes, how does the news get out? And the other one says, if the news had the ability to get out, how does that change? But there's a really cool story you didn't talk about there, and that's those things interact with each other. That some of these populations that had the ability for the news to get out, actually it turns out the news didn't get out. So we should be able to harness that variability in how the news got out to give an even more nuanced picture about how the 
the multiplex and the support changes in these areas that have had exposure to microfinance, because even those who got the exposure got it at different rates. So I'm wondering if you've done any analysis in that vein yet, uh, what sort of conclusions came from that that are different from what you talked about today, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, so very good point. So there is variability in, in the villages that were exposed to microfinance, and then you would expect the ones that had less diffusion to be less impacted. And so what we've done is looked at a more micro level where we look at the actual dyads and test whether the, they were directly a result of microfinance uh, taking households. And so we use some propensity scoring and other things to estimate which households would have been in the villages that weren't affected and the ones that were. And then you can see a direct effect that it's actually the one. So you get a stronger implication that it was the ones. I didn't have time to go through it all, but that's another part of the. Uh, so it's a very good, very good idea. And indeed, that's something that you see in the data. I, uh, we heard a lot about multiplexes uh, today. And uh, what I was wondering is. If you're, what is the story about coevolution in these multiplexes? Because what we heard mostly is snapshots of layers laid upon other layers. But the question is, is there, are there any stories about the dynamics that we can tell, for example, about between grooming and aggression in chimpanzees or in Al Capone's evolution of network between cri the criminal network and the political network and, and math uh, networks and so on. So is there some story to be told there? There's definitely a story to be told there. I, I don't have it yet in terms of the organized crime case. Mostly um, because my data is so event specific, I tend to get these sort of moments where there was clearly a relationship, but when that relationship began and ended becomes really complicated with my database. Um, though I wonder with your research if that might actually be more possible to look at um, the sort of timing of those relationships. Yes, this is something we're very interested in looking at, looking at more of the dynamical nature of the changes of those relationships over time, even within stable or unstable periods. Um, to my knowledge, uh, the development of those kinds of longitudinal um, techniques are not as sophisticated as they could be. And I think people are working on that as we speak. So. Like Zeb <laughs> and is one of them. <laughs> with, with Vikram, who was already yeah. mentioned earlier, and myself and Zeb, we have a project where we're looking at co-evolution of uh, edge dynamics in different layers, using things like Markov chains to try and come up with a null model where we treat the layers independently. And then we go to the data and we get the full-blown uh, possibility of transitions between all the states on all the layers and compare the null model, which assumes that the layers don't interact, with a um, full-blown model from the data showing the interactions. So we're hoping to <laughs> work with Brenda <laughs> and get at some of that as well. Yeah, I have a question. This is so you guys, you're in for it now made me ask a question. So I'm Ron Mangan. I'm the Dean of Social Sciences here. And um, the last three weeks of these, the launch for the Institute, people seek me out and Joe to tell us, oh, this is so great. I learned all these things that I didn't know. And I made connections with people I'd never met. And of course, that's the whole idea, one of the ideas. And we heard that from our chancellor this morning in her opening remarks. So what I'm wondering is, You've been listening to all this today, your, your, your colleagues talk about their work across different fields. I'm very curious to know what you experts have learned from each other today. What are the, what are the gems that you're going to take away from this event? Too many to mention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really excited to be coming to UC Davis to be working with all these great computer scientists who are going to help me figure out some of the modeling issues. <laughs> and I, I think it's remarkable the cross-cutting 
work that we're doing, because none of us, many of us didn't even know each other before today, and clearly there are a lot of common threads that we're going through. So I think that gives a boost about why we really need to be more aggressive about interdisciplinary work, because there's much, so much to be learned. So it's exciting. The, the one thing that's sticking with me right now is something in Matt's talk that your um, stable edges, because in some sense you would think if you have multiple partners to trade with, you might be more willing to break an edge. Mm -hmm. So it reminded me a bit of the policing that you don't, that you don't want to upset your friends' friends mm -hmm. as well. So it, it seemed like there was some kind of this policing behavior going on in these social networks, because from a purely rational perspective, we might think that you would be advantaged to have two edges mm -hmm. and that you could do whatever you wanted because you've got more people willing to interact with you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I say one thing that you know, I, a lot of times our disciplines, our, our fields have been siloed historically by accident. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing you saw today is that the, the, the right cuts in, in areas really go across what are traditional fields. And that pre presents a lot of challenges. So an institute like this is, is wonderful in the sense that it brings people together and can allow for the collaborations. Then the other part of that is making sure that the home departments are open to it and, and you know, encourage people to be publishing across, you know, to, do, to, to, to have people doing network science, teaming together with people doing primate re research, and then you know, publishing in journals that might be outside their normal area. And, and, and it's obvious here that the, the opportunities are enormous and the potential is really strong, and realizing that is a, is a challenge, but it looks like the Institute is taking a good first step in that direction. I mean, one thing that's really amazing, given how different we all are, is some of the common themes that emerged, too. And I think that's very telling about the importance of having an institute on social sciences. And I'll actually add to what Matt said. Um, when I started working with people in philosophy and economics and so forth, it's more than just departments you have to negotiate. It's different sort of norms that you learn along the way. I mean, economists publish in or alphabetical order. People in biology publish with the senior author last. People in psychology have traditionally done it with the senior author first. First. And so those become very important things that often aren't appreciated as some of the upfront costs to doing these collaborations. But the rewards are worth it. And I'll just emphasize what Reza said about how it seems like we're all, have, and also what uh, Sarah said, that we have these common themes. And it, it seems to me that it, it suggests that all these different fields are facing similar kinds of issues and problems, even though they're very different in terms of their content, um, and that, uh, that, that these, the processes that um, develop these, form these networks are very similar across these different systems. And again, where, where a better place in social sciences to bring them all together? Hi. It, it's, not, it's not so much a question as a challenge, and because I was only here half of the day, this might be really unfair. But it seems to me that, that there's incredible communal, uh, commonality in the methods that you're using. But do you think that you guys could um, talk theoretically at the same level? Or address the same questions, or really be driven by this? Well, you're, you are addressing the same questions, but be driven by the same deeper models. <coughs> Maybe there's no answer, sorry. <laughs> I can answer that for you. So I was overhearing uh, two of our speakers after the last session, and one of them said to the other, gee, microeconomics sounds a lot like statistical physics. <laughs> And maybe part of the, the beauty is that we want different methodology as well, right? Because every field makes assumptions. And if we just work within our field, we don't question those assumptions. So I think there's value to the fact that actually our methodology does differ. And where are we going to have conflicting results could actually tell us a lot of interesting things. And come, we come at it from different angles. I mean, uh, you weren't here this morning, but I started this. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, but when I was starting, I start with the dyad and work up to the group, whereas some of the other people are starting at the group and trying to work down to the level of the dyad. And I think that meeting in the middle is important because we might get to different places starting at different levels of the analysis. Um, and I think that's critical. I don't think we want there to be one social science. I think it's important to keep training people individually as well. I have a question for Matt. Uh, one of the things that I didn't hear you talk about were the money lenders. And traditionally in Indian society, money lenders played a very central role in the community. And you didn't talk about the relationship between centrality and wealth. Um, it would seem to me what the micro lending was doing just based upon your data was displacing the money lenders with um, new institutions such that um, there may be other cultural dynamics involved. Uh, yes, in, uh, yes, indeed, there, there are a lot of money lenders in the villages, and actually you can see them in the borrowing and lending network because there are households that have um, unusually large degrees, so they're borrowing and lending with a lot of other individuals, and you can also see it in the direction of the answers to the questions. So people will say that they borrowed from this household, but they didn't say that they ever lent to that household. Um, one thing that's different about the traditional money lenders and the uh, microfinance tends to be the, the size of the loans, the structure of the loans, and the interest rates. So the interest rates are high, but they're not quite as high as, as you would get from a traditional money lender. They're a little more structured and flexible. And you know, together with with the other things that go into one of these loans, there's also education that comes along with it. So people are taught you know, a little bit of financial, uh, basic finance in terms of how you make payments, how, how you have to structure your budget, and don't go spend it all at once. You know, simple, but common, common sense kinds of things that can be very important. So I think there's, you know, understanding the full dynamic between that isn't as easy as one might imagine. And, and one thing we haven't done is of a more anthropological study where a lot of this was survey-based data and, and a few snapshots rather than detailed analysis of how people are spending their days, what they're doing with their money, who they're talking to in terms of money lenders and how that interaction is changing now that they're getting money from a bank rather than somebody else in the village. So I think the bank has more resources and a lot of other things going on, but, but there's still a lot we didn't do in this type of study that we could do um, better with that type of information. Yeah, okay, I'll uh, ask a more general question again. Um, so, I mean, I just, it's really exciting to see how many cross, I'll stand up because I can't see half the people. Uh, it's exciting to see how many kind of overlapping themes, methods, theories are happening here. And all three Fridays, we've had excitement over and connections happening just between speakers who hadn't known each other's work before. And since part of the Institute's goal is to figure out how to kind of keep those kind of, do we call them serendipitous connections, just because they haven't happened according to the network structure of the academy right now. Um, so we're gonna name that chance. Um, so, you know, one question is what other forums might there be to kind of do this? And, you know, the first day was about, uh, was focused on technology. Like, so in each day, disciplinary change, uh, the changes that were happening in each of your disciplines was put on the table. You know, so, you know, how does one look at the effects of cell phones on networks, et cetera? Um, and the second day was more organized around data and how does you know different types of data science or just the fact that we have these new data sets change things like graduate training and then today kind of by focusing on networks and decision making again we see new things that are raised both by the, the quantity and kind of data that's available easily and becomes the kind of thing that right now you can do as a graduate student uh, you know equivalent to the way gene sequencing used to be, you'd have one dissertation to sequence one thing, and now we run 100 in you know, a day or two. Um, so the kinds, the scale of questions, the types of questions change. So 
at the micro level, I'm interested for any of you to reflect a little bit on like what you see might be changing in terms of what you'd want from graduate student training now. Are there new things that you think should be, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot and say required, but just, you know, the new capacities or skills that you're interested in seeing develop. Um, you know, the data fluency last week was very clearly to have graduate students who aren't fluent in s at least kind of basic forms of data manipulation or at minimum not afraid of it. Uh, it's, it's different. Ten years ago, that was not on the table in most disciplines. I mean, you know, some mathematical skills in many disciplines was required, but not data fluency. Mm -hmm. And now I think that's become more. So I'm wondering in terms of network analysis, which is something I really don't know much about, what, how, what are those skills look like? Um, so in general, I'm just interested in your thoughts on these type <coughs> of issues because I think the kind of serendipity of the future depends on having more types of competencies. Um, you know, with Chris as an example of someone who's just finishing a dissertation, using all sorts of tools that would not have been considered earlier, and certainly not for a graduate student to do. It might have been considered a risky move rather than something that, you know, resulted in you getting a wonderful job here. So I'll leave it at that. Then. That's a uh, provocation. Yeah. It's actually a conversation we've been having at the University of Massachusetts, and at least in socio the sociology department, is that so much of the training is on linear modeling, and that so much of the new models are not linear, and just sort of reading more at the graduate level about um, relational inequality, relational forms, and then the relational modeling. So it is a conversation, I think, that we've been having. I'm in a department, though, changing the curriculum is a different conversation. Oh, okay. So, uh, so I think it is a risky move for graduate students in a lot of disciplines. Um, uh, some places, of course, are, are hot, uh, you know, bioinformatics, it's, it's, it's fine to be interdisciplinary, right, because uh, money is pouring into that field. But in the social sciences, it can be a risky move crossing disciplinary boundaries. And you say, well, what could you do for graduate students? Um, uh, well, one thing uh, I think that would be good for graduate students would be that if you could run an interdisciplinary seminar in which graduate students discuss their own interdisciplinary work for one another, right? Uh, uh, like this, only for graduate students that met maybe weekly, um, that would be good for graduate students being able to do this. Um, on the other uh, end of things, um, there's a question of getting hired if you cross disciplines, uh, and that's where the dean can do something, right? That is, um, at, at Irvine, uh, we have an Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences, um, and this institute cannot hold faculty positions. They have to be held in the disciplines. But it is given faculty lines to recruit, right? And the discipline can say, no, we don't want them, right? Uh, but it has uh, really uh, led to hiring some very good scholars that would not have been hired otherwise, not because anybody thought that they weren't good, but, but they weren't in, you know, the area that we thought we, our department should go in. And um, so maybe you could give this discipline some lines. <laughs> I'd love to. Outgoing um, dean, well. Yeah. Yeah, as a, and, in fact. Uh, act, act fast. Yeah, my last act, I'll, uh, how many do you want, Joe? <laughs> Actually, I totally agree with that, and I think that is a six. <laughs> I think that you're absolutely right, and the times where I've seen that happen, that's exactly the mechanism that allows this thinking outside the box to happen. And you don't know me, but I've actually built two of those centers, one at Duke and one here at Davis, the Center for Mind and Brain and the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at Duke. And so I am, I am a well-converted believer in that sort of thing. So thank you. I think you just got that right. <laughs> And, and it's been a long debate. As, as someone who was trained as a statistical physicist, I did postdocs in applied math and theoretical computer scientist. 
I joined UC Davis in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. After I got tenure, I moved half of my appointment over to computer science. So I am always out of my depth. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's something that is, is a challenge. So you, know, you always want to be an expert in the places that you are. Um, and it seems like uh, right now it's all of these one-offs. So I'm a person who's done this, and there's other people coming through. But it's getting much more common, but we don't have those mechanisms in place. So I moved department affiliations after having tenure. We're bringing people on board now as junior faculty spanning multiple departments, and that's really stressful. And there's always been this, the whole time I was a grad student moving through my own career path, there's always been this um, feedback that I've gotten, like you won't be an expert in anything. You don't have a discipline. And it's, it's something, of course, that we need to worry about, that you don't get any depth because you're too um, spread too broadly. That's not what Joe's question was. It was, what are the skills that modern students need? And I think that's an easier question to answer, but it's something that fits into that bigger picture, too. Like, how do we make sure people really have a grounding in a discipline? And then more so, how do we make sure that the universities that exist and the existing departments and faculty who've been there for quite a long time acknowledge that these are exciting new places to be? So there's a lot of tension all over the campus of more younger interdisciplinary folks. There's certainly many senior folks who are very interdisciplinary, but there's also a lot of senior folks who want to see their disciplines stay as they are. So there's many tensions to, to making this happen. And every university is facing it, right? So we clearly need the administration to remind us that it's not about the number of papers that you've published or where they're published, or if you're the first author on them, if you're publishing with multiple disciplines. But it takes a lot of work. It sounds like one of your phase transitions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And in fact, I was going to say maybe that's something else we all have in common, because I trained as an evolutionary biologist and did a postdoc in anthropology, and I'm now in psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience, so I too am never the expert. Um, but I actually got hired by a similar interdisciplinary initiative, the Brains and Behavior Program, and was put in psychology. And I think that gives people a home. And I'm in the Cognitive Sciences Program, which is by its very nature interdisciplinary. And one of the things that we've really looked at is how to train people to have the depth, but then to have the skills to know what they need to learn and how to learn it. And I think if we, we don't have the answer yet, um, but I think if we can figure out how to do that, that helps because it allows people to have that disciplinary home to get into a traditional uh, faculty line, but then to expand the way they need to. Um, and we also have things in place um, at my university that are interdisciplinary seed grants that you can only get if you're collaborating across different departments that really encourage interdisciplinarity, which makes it okay. When you come up for tenure, the fact that you have a law review in the psych department suddenly becomes a good thing because it proves you're doing what you're supposed to be doing rather than a scary, we don't know what to do with this PNAS paper in economics. Um, so I think there are beginning to be more examples of how you can make this work well. And one Sorry. comment just to Joe's question really quickly about, you know, with grad students are amazingly good at figuring out what they, what they should be learning. And part of it's just giving them the opportunity. So if you put them in an environment where they're seeing other papers and suddenly realizing that they're narrower than they thought, that their discipline isn't giving them all the tools that they need, they can go out and find those tools. And so it's part of it's just having a flexibility that the programs allow them to take something beyond their, their narrow um, course load and, and I think the interaction then teaches them more about, I've learned more about my own discipline by interacting outside of it than ever interacting within it and, and I think you know you really learn where your limitations are and it's helpful so giving them the opportunity would be is, is a lot of. Great so just you all raised such important issues about how we value scholarship and how we judge it and how we promote it and it, you, you, know, you put your finger right on it, that this is something that administrations with faculty really have to work on. And we are doing that here, just like throughout the UC and across the country. There's a lot of discussions about this, so I think your comments are particularly timely. And they don't fall on deaf ears. You know, the institution has to understand how to value interdisciplinary work and how to, how to judge its quality and so on if it's going to promote it. And we're already promoting it. Now we have to do the other side. We have to sort of change the culture, which is a faculty culture. You know, we have our strong Senate and shared governance. But there is an important role for the administration and for faculty leadership to do that. And it is happening, and it's an important thing. And there's another thing that I want to say. Once in my life, I was the very last speaker right before a wine and cheese event. 
And there was a last question, and it kind of went on long because it was really interesting, and it went on and on and on and on and on. And then finally somebody said, oh, I guess it's time we better stop. And then we all clapped and we went into the wine and cheese thing. And uh, a friend of mine, a member of the National Academy, uh, Leslie Ungerleiter, who's about this tall, walked up to me on her high heels, that's what made her this tall, with a glass of wine in her hand. She looked up at me and she says, you know, Ron, nobody ever complained about a talk that ended on time. Joe? <laughs> <laughs> all right, in the spirit of no complaints, um, thank you all for a wonderful uh, ending session and for an awesome day and all of these connections and future uh, conversations to be had. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Vicki Austin, who has uh, lost a lot of sleep over this event. And, and then to uh, Belinda Martina and uh, Lauren Thomas and uh, Monica Fisher, who did all the support that kept this whole thing running utterly smoothly with great receptions that we're about to have. <laughs> <laughs>